Hi, everyone. Welcome to the MoonCon 21 panel on shamanism. I'm Kelly Harrell, joined by fellow panelist Ken Day and Imelda Omquist. We each come from different paths and perspectives, and we'll talk a bit about our books published by Moon Books, how our paths have evolved with the writing of and since the writing of those books, and we hope to touch a bit on ancestor tending and animism and, and whatever we need to if we have the time. If you have questions, please send them along and we'll address them at the end of our discussion. Ken, will you get us started with a little bit about yourself, your book, and how your path has evolved since writing it? Thank you, Kelly. Yes, actually, I am right in the middle of teaching an online workshop on shamanism, specifically on working with spirits. Uh, and I'm taking an extended lunch break in order to do this, so that's fine. <laughs> so these are the books that are currently available through, um, through Moon Books. I have a number of other books that I've included in anthologies, uh, also in Sacred Hoop uh, magazine, things like that. But the work that I do is focused on people who have a need for the various and sundry healing modalities of shamanism, but live in the Western culture. We have some very important differences between those of us who live in this Western culture and those living in a more traditional tribal culture. And this is why I refer to the kind of shamanism I do as post-tribal shamanism. And I want to be very clear, this is done in order to honor those tribal cultures from which we all emerge in our ancestry. So it is to honor the elders of those traditions, to honor our own elders in our own traditions, but also to honor the fact that we are in a different place today than those ancestors were, and of course, than those elders in more traditional cultures are. One of the biggest differences that I have noted and experienced directly is the difference between being part of a communal tribal identity that sense of communion that we receive from being part of a greater whole that we are so isolated from in Western culture. It is that which leads us to venerate and work toward such incredible individuation. So our icon of social attainment is the rugged individualist, right? Nowhere in human history has the rugged individualist been anything people were striving for in general. Yeah. It's only today in this culture. So my on God, my spirit ally, the one who has taught me what I teach, the teachings I pass on, who I call grandfather, it's kind of an honorary, has focus his teachings on the people who arise in this post-tribal culture. So, for instance, instead of the shaman going and doing all the work for you, there is a sense that the shaman is there to empower the individual to do as much of that work for themselves as possible. Right? And that shows up in the rituals or ceremonies, even things like soul retrieval which of course is done in pretty much every form of shamanic healing. The, it, what we do is instead of me going and doing the retrieval for you, bringing that back and blowing it into you, what I do is engage you in the journey, <clears throat> bring you into your shamanic body so that you can journey directly to those places, welcome that lost piece back and reintegrate. So that in a sense, and in essence, is what I do. It's almost just like traditional shamanism, but in our current setting. It doesn't rely on teachings from any other cultures. And yet, if you look at those other cultures, it's going to look a lot like some of those. In fact, I resisted calling myself a shaman for a good 10 years or more. And it wasn't until multiple shamans from different traditions 
kept telling me that what I was doing was shamanism, that I finally got it through my thick skull, that my ego was getting in the way by not acknowledging that. So there was one uh, Siberian shaman in particular, excuse me, Mongolian, she, she was a Mongolian shaman called Sarah Garrel, uh, who was very clear that she thought I was being ridiculous for not acknowledging that what I was doing was shamanism. She said, you're just confusing people. Why are you doing that? <laughs> so hopefully I'm confusing people less now. <laughs> so, Kelly, did you want to pick up from there or Amelda? Amelda, you can. Um, okay. Well, I have three books out uh, published by Moon Books and a fourth one out next year. That's going to be about the pre-Christian spirituality of the Netherlands because I am Dutch. And my own journey was a bit of a zigzag. I'm married to a Swede, and when I first met him and visited Stockholm for the first time, uh, the Norse gods just grabbed me, and that was that. They stayed with me for, li for life and, uh, you know, started working with them, but not in any kind of professional capacity. Then later on in life, calling came in other ways. I did some training with teachers of core shamanism because really for reasons of childcare, like it was near enough for me to get there and get the childcare sorted, it was practical. Um, but those Norse gods were always there. And what you learn from core shamanism is incredibly useful because it is so neutral. And as Ken was just saying, it really was done in many cultures and can be implied in lots of ways. So I ended up going back to my ancestral tradition. That is the old Norse or Northern tradition. And today I work with and I teach uh, Seder and Old Norse traditions with a special focus on historical accuracy because there's quite a lot of nonsense out there that people keep on repeating in blogs and things. So, you know, I take my students through the, uh, you know, the historically accurate information. I can use quite a lot of Old Norse words and some people love that and some people don't, but really try to give them a feeling for what, what the language would have sounded like and what was going on there. And, um, also, I'm a painter, so my second book was about art, sacred art, so I teach a lot of art as well. I've done a lot of spiritual toolkit work for children, and my book published October last year was about uh, fearless use of the human imagination, and that's another huge theme in my work. And I think that's about it in a nutshell. Really excited to be on a panel with the two of you. Um, I'd love to hear from Kelly now. Thank you both for, for what you're contributing to this conversation and what you're contributing to the broader community. Um, uh, let's see. So I'm author of several books. The one that is published through Moon Books is Teen Spirit Guide to Modern Shamanism. And I love this cover. They did such a great job with it. You know, y'all know you don't always get to pick those things. And when they when they nail it, it's just wonderful. So I'm I'm really thrilled with that. Um my books focus on soul tending and the elder Futhark runes. My practice is soul intent arts and I'm based on traditional Sisipaha land in North Carolina. I write the weekly rune cast, which you can find at my website and I host the podcast, What in the Weird. Um, for the last 25 years, my work has largely focused on helping others to ethically build thriving spiritual paths. And for me, that translates into becoming a fit elder, to, to be able to embody yourself as an elder to become a strong ancestor. Um, my personal path encompasses Seder and Druidry, and I focus a lot on death walking and eldering well using the runes. I find that they're a really wonderful tool for how to human well period. So uh, Teen Spirit Guide to Modern Shamanism came out in 2014, I think. And at the time that I wrote it, there wasn't a lot of dialogue in the modern shamanism community on why we do a lot of what we do. We, we, we kind of had this recipe that we were given from core shamanism, which we y'all both touched on, that was really useful. And I started seeing folks um, 
following this kind of standard recipe for soul travel, but when the recipe didn't work for them for all kinds of reasons, like neurodivergence or feeling pulled into ancestral paths of shamanism, when the recipe didn't work, they didn't have resources that helped them to do it differently. And, and maybe ex the book expresses why they needed something besides that stock recipe and kind of gives them some touchstones for where to look. So it, the book is really meant as a primer for people who were just awakening to that soul calling and also for those who maybe aren't so new to their path, but wanted a deeper understanding of what they're doing, like how their calling can translate into a shamanic um, grounding. And what has evolved for me from the writing of that book is a lot of boots on the ground discussion of how we personalize path. I, I think like that's the bottom line. And what soul tending has to look like in a settler culture. And by has to look like, I don't mean the way that I do it, but helping people discover the way they do it. And, and I think you touched on that really well, Ken. Um, you know, we have unique challenges to meet in the big systems that we exist among, in, in all these aspects of othering that make the way we access soul travel different. So, where I've gone since publishing the book is just examining how that all still works for me. And in some cases it doesn't. There are places in the book where the way that I move is very differently. And, and I did a podcast on that actually about two or three months ago. I think that that's pretty much it there. Okay, then I will pick up here because like we discussed things and decided to talk about ancestors and ancestral healing work. I really loved what you said there, Kelly, that, you know, the intention to be a strong elder and really do the work of eldering to eventually become a compassionate ancestor. I think that's very much the track that I'm on as well. So why are ancestors so important? When I did the research for my fourth book, The Pre-Christian Spirituality of the Netherlands, you know, I was taken back to a time where ancestor veneration was still a completely standard thing. And we find it in all um, indigenous or tribal cultures as well, that ancestor veneration and honoring and consulting the ancestors is at the very heart of the life of the tribe. And it's like a very strange thing that we have completely thrown it out. In Western culture, we often think that the ancestors are long dead. What's that got to do with me? And like, why should I even think about them? which is a very empty, um, desolate attitude. Um, and then also what happens, the fact that we do not honor the ancestors, um, you know, it's not fair. Think you yourself will be an ancestor one day. What would you like from the living when that day comes? My own work, even if groups of children have brought this, very young children, you know, doing the work on this have said, well, the ancestors want to be remembered but they also want to be honored for the gifts that they have passed on. And, you know, in, to some extent, we live in a world created by the ancestors. We also co-created ourselves. And the thing is that a lot of problems that human beings have today, or even that the world has today, actually are ancestral in origin. Because I do a lot of ancestral healing work with people. And then you see that any issues that a person or a family you know, drums in the family. So issues a person doesn't resolve by the time they die, they kind of pull in the ancestral field and they don't just stay there. But, you know, a person in the next generation may skip a generation, they're going to come along and pick up the backpack, as it were, and then it will start playing out again. And people in contemporary culture often don't realize that the issues that they grapple with sometimes don't even originate with them. They started a long time ago and our ancestors sort of, you know, struggled with the same issues. And then, you know, once you realize that and you learn how to do ancestral healing work, you can start lifting these imprints from families, meaning that families become unburdened and that individuals become more free to lead the lives of their dream, to like, follow their own calling, which I think is hugely important work. So that's what I have to say. Um, over to Kelly now, please, on the center. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think 
the ancestral tending is the work of our time. Like if I had to pick one thing that was, you know, what, and it com encompasses so many things, but I, I feel like that is the work that is on the table right now. And that was part of the conversation that wasn't happening in, in the more mainstream modern shamanism community in the nineties. So I've, I've really enjoyed watching that come to the fore of this work. I can say without hesitation that when I started working with my well ancestors, that my soul work deepened and clarified significantly, but I, I found that my personal needs were met at, in a much um, more fulfilling way. And I, I learned how to do that for myself from them. My work with students and clients, most of the time, you touched on this, Imelda, is to learn the places that where patterns are replaying the stuck places in their lives that they aren't necessarily about them at all and and that's um hugely significant in ancestral dynamics that we carry unconsciously and don't realize we're playing out and i i don't think we can have this conversation without mentioning intergenerational trauma and how that contributes to influences in our lives in the present. And being having a technology, having um, skills to be able to address that, it doesn't just improve our personal lives, it improves how we show up in community and, and how we move through the world. It, it has a collective impact. And that's one thing about ancestral tending compared to maybe some other um, roles that soul tenders play, um, that really does have a huge collective impact. It's not just this thing that makes our personal lives better, but we become able to identify when dynamics that are playing out are not ours and we become able to shift the dynamics in our lives to make them more um, supportive for us and the people around us. So I think the reconciliation of our wounds, uh, of how we elder in this life and, and being able to die well is, is kind of the crux of my ancestral work. Not just you know, the end result of having to do that healing, but helping people know how to live well so that we can be well ancestors at our death. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What about you, Ken? Yeah. <laughs> As a shaman, obviously, ancestors are a huge and fundamental part of the work that I do, both with clients and with uh, students as well. And where it shows up initially is that certainly with most clients that I see, some part of that is going to be connected with their ancestors in practically every case. I don't think there's been a single client I've had in the last 30 years where I haven't had to engage with their ancestors at some point during their healing. And most people, it's the whole thing. You know, our ancestors are the ones that gave us the gift of life, without which we wouldn't be here today. And so that puts them above us and means that we are constantly beholden to them because that's not a gift that we can give back. You know, we can pass it on. We can live the best life we can, but that always remains. And so even when our ancestors are people that we don't necessarily like, that may have damaged us, traumatized us during their lifetime and ours, we still owe them a sense of honoring. Now, sometimes that honoring is from a safe distance, right? But it's still there. The fact that we wouldn't be here without them is such a profound realization from most of us. I know what I have referred to it as, as the uh, invisible wound is that huge disconnection between us as individuals and that communal entity of our ancestors. You know, the teachings that grandfather has shared with me, we have three souls at least. And one of those is the ancestral soul. And the nature of the ancestral soul is communal. So there is this way in which we are at one 
with all of our blood ancestors going back, you know, so many generations until the first, wherever that was. And that when we die, part of us returns to that ancestral communion. So the more we can begin to engage with that sense of communal self in this lifetime, the more fruitful and rich and alive we are in this lifetime. Mm. So one of the first things I have my clients and students do is to create an ancestor altar in their home. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes this is a windowsill, a um, mantelpiece, and I've seen some that are quite elaborate, but uh, you know, there's always room to honor your ancestors. And then just developing a regular habit, even if it's just putting a glass of water there, or I've got some ancestors that really like their whiskey. So you know, I'll put a little bit of whiskey in there and it really lights them up. But always honoring those who came before us, those upon whose shoulders we stand and letting them know that part of honoring them is to acknowledge that their burdens belong with them and that they're strong enough to carry those and that we have our own burdens and we don't need to be carrying them. And since I started doing this work, I came across back around 2001, an amazing technique called uh, family constellation work, mm -hmm. which is essentially group shamanism. You know, they, they treat it very phenomenologically, but it's clearly, the first time I saw it, it's like, oh, there's the ancestors, there's the ancestral soul, they call it the field, that's nice. <laughs> it's group shamanism. So, Often I will incorporate elements from that as well. And it has really deepened and enriched my own experience of my ancestors because it makes them so palpably present in this moment to have somebody be able to stand there and go, wow, I am your father or your great grandmother. In some cases it goes all the way back to the land of your, your ancestors. There was this wonderful constellation years ago where there was this big figure back there. And everyone was just in awe of this figure. And all the lines of the family went back to that figure. And we couldn't figure out what it was. And finally, we, I just went up and asked her, so what do you represent? And she just smiled and spread her arms and said, I am Ireland. <laughs> nice. And everyone just got it. And you could feel the shift in the soul like that. So some of us, you know, if we if our souls are fortunate enough to go back to such a profound, strong figure, then that too is extremely healing. But really, you know, ancestor work is all about healing, but it's healing through connection. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make is thinking that we need to forgive the ancestors, that we need to forgive the parents. And that's one of the things I learned in constellation work, uh, which is it's really impudent of us as the children to feel like we have a right to forgive our parents, or our ancestors. They are the ones that bear the responsibility for their actions. We can leave that with them, but it's not up to us to place ourselves in a position where we can forgive them. It's not our job. And I think that that is one of the more pr profound and powerful pieces that I've learned in that practice. So yeah, ancestors every day. I've got my ancestor altar right over there home with several other altars and every day make sure that the offerings are there and I'll sit down and recite some of their names and see if they've got anything for me and usually it's just a pat on the back and a hug but nothing wrong with that yeah yeah wonderful and tell them the family news I always tell them the family yeah. news. I do that yeah. too <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah.
Um, wonderful. I think also that word connection you mentioned there leads us in to, I think, the final topic we're going to talk about, and that being animism and maybe also eldering will come back, it's had a mention. And for that, I'd like to go to you, Kelly. Would you talk to us about animism and what that word means in your practice? In my my vantage point, which is growing and evolving all the time, animism is the experience that everything has consciousness and, and some degree of agency. But coming back to what you said, Ken, the core of that is connection. It's relationship. It's that it is it it is an inclusive sphere of of being that we are all participating in. So the question that I typically pose to my students and my clients is, you know, it isn't the question that we are in these relationships. It's are we aware that we're in these relationships and are we actively participating in them? I grew up with an animistic grandfather who was a beekeeper. He would have never used that word. Like I'm not even sure if he knew that word, but but that was his lens of life. And that, that, I mean, he literally taught me that everything is alive. And I remember beekeeping with him. And, well, you know, I only did the like little kid version of that, but still <laughs> doing that work with him and watching how he became the bees. He became the hive and the space around him. He became the honey when it was extraction season. That is the awareness that I carry even now into where I stand. Like that is a saying that I say to my students over and over, animism is where you stand. And that means that you're already in relationship with that space, with the spirits of place, the nature spirits. How aware are you of that fact? And how do you move among them in a way that honors that awareness? So, I regard the role as soul tender, sort of like a, a lens of that. A lot of people ask me, what's the difference between animism and shamanism? And I, I think that is a conversation that we can have for a really, really long time. Um, I, I feel that we all have the capacity to, to be animistic and to acknowledge and honor involvement in those relationships, but not everybody wants to be situated in in a way that is a leader in in a, in a means between those relationships and that's that's in a, in a very oversimplified way what i feel the distinction is between the two um you know we can all engage animistically in the relationships that we live among where we stand but to be a conduit of the seen and unseen is is a different thing that that plays on some different skills and some different maybe uh, rituals. Not everybody wants to be in that role. So the other thing that I tell my students, I, they, I probably say it a little too much, is to, to stand in that awareness, to, to just make it a practice, to, to notice where your feet are at any given time and just stand in the awareness of that space. Be the soul of that space. Is that Rumi? I think that's Rumi said that. Um, I tell them, elder well, die well, ancestor well that that's if i had anything that i could put on the, like a t-shirt i think that would be it that's what we're here to do that that's that's our job here and that's our that's our role in humanity right now i buy the t-shirt kelly <laughs> <laughs> all right that's funny uh you know i just went over animism and the, the workshop I'm teaching about an hour and a half ago. So it's kind of, you know, as if it wasn't already up on my mind all the time anyway, it's kind of fresh. And beyond the essential definition, which much like yours, Kelly, is simply that it's the awareness that everything is alive. Everything is alive and imbued with spirit and varying degrees of sentience. And that even manufactured items Mm -hmm. and gain life and spirit with you. you know? But to speak briefly to the concept of the relationship between shamanism and animism, you can have animism without shamanism, yes. but you can't have shamanism without animism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's simple as that. A shaman who doesn't 
get that everything is alive? Probably isn't a shaman, at least not with the definition I use. And I'm sure that we have probably three different or slightly different definitions of shamanism. You know, the shamanism definition that I use begins with the uh, the person being chosen by the spirit, by that own god or that uh, shamanic uh, ally that comes and initiates them into the process, which is not usually fun. <laughs> so right there, that runs up against our egalitarian society that says, well, anybody should be able to do this. Well, yeah, that's nice. I agree. I mean, anyone should be able to do it, but what it comes down to is if you weren't chosen, then you can, I love this, uh, Amina Butmank, who's a, 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 a Mongolian shaman, uses the term shamanist to differentiate between somebody who's a practicing shaman and somebody who's just practicing shamanism instead of being a shaman. And uh, there's a lot of shamanists out there, and I think that's great, and you can probably do a lot of good. And there's a difference. Just like there's a difference between creative visualization and shamanic journey. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm amazed how many people here in the West don't get that. Yeah, you're right. I'm amazed. So one of the things I do with my students the first time we journey, I say, okay, I want you to imagine, I want you to visualize a really big tree. Got it? Okay, now move that six feet to the left. No problem, right? Okay. Then we go into shamanic body, and I introduce them to the world tree. And they go up and they touch the world tree. Okay, so now move that six feet to the left. I have yet to have anybody move it even a quarter of an inch, right? And that's what we don't seem to get initially here in the West, is that there is actually a reality mm. that goes beyond anything that we can touch and feel and see and smell and taste. A reality that is so profound. And so much of the work I do, with, especially with students, but also with clients, is helping them learn to differentiate between their own imagination and the other ways. Because we're raised with this idea that if we are seeing it not in the sensual world out here, but in our own minds, then it's imagination and therefore it's unreal. <laughs> well, if that's unreal, then therefore everything I see in my mind is unreal. Right? But when you learn how to use, say, the observer mind technique in meditation to observe your thoughts. And of course, you observe your thoughts from observer mind, they dissolve. You observe your dreams, they dissolve. You observe these visions coming up, they dissolve. You observe the world tree, it doesn't dissolve. Right? Yeah. So yeah. differentiation, connection. Yeah. Realization is so important, but it has to be based on authentic experience. We can't just say, well, I, I dreamed of this purple dragon, and that's now my spirit helper, or my the spirit guide, and they're going to take me on a trip. There's this lovely saying in the New Age that all roads lead to the top of the mountain. Unfortunately, it's not true. Very few of those actually lead to the top of the mountain. A lot of them just kind of circle I was around. That, I was seeing that in my mind as you said yeah. it. <laughs> and then they tremble off to the mall and do a little shopping. But they don't get you anywhere near to the top of the mountain. Yeah. So you have to learn how to discern. You have to be able to tell what works and what doesn't. And animism is a great place, a, an essential place to start. Because without that realization, and I have people start off and say, just think of a few items that are important to you, a few of your physical possessions that are important to you, maybe one or two. And just imagine that that item is alive. Maybe you can give it a name, right? And then play with that. You pick it up, handle it, treat it with respect, treat it the way you would uh, treat 
somebody who you wanted to develop a healthy relationship with. Do that for a couple of weeks and then get back to me. Mm. Right? And it just starts to open up that awareness and begin that internal dialogue between all these different parts of the self that are waking up and the realm of spirits that surrounds us. It's yeah. a lot to deal with. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think I also wanted to get back to the word elders a bit because we've talked about our human elders and about eldering well and uh, becoming ancestors and, you know, that T-shirt that I can't get. <laughs> but I also don't just feel like being out on the lens that I come face to face with a rock and that rock is so much older than I am or the sea or a lake or, you know, you name it, those features in the landscape or... You know, when you start a dialogue with the wind and the wind talks back and, you know, just wanted to sort of name that. There is also such a thing, I think, as, you know, the elders in nature, these beings that were around long before yes. we are, and they will be there long after I personally am. And in terms of animism, I think one of the strongest experiences I had was I liked playing the cello in the forest. And on one occasion, it was a beautiful night. It was a full moon, so I was playing by, by moonlight. And it was quite windy. And it got to the point where I tried to see if I could enter a dialogue with the wind. So I would play something on the cello, and then it would be a pause. And then the winds would sort of come through the foliage of the trees and it would give a reply and then I would play again picking up on what the wind was doing and the wind would pause and it would respond and then I would pause and the wind would respond and I thought you know that was quite early in my days of you know doing shamanic training and all these worlds opening up and it was like wow you can actually do that you can play the cello in the forest and you know you can have that dialogue with the wind and other times i've had deer coming really close up in their wow. horns and having that dialogue where you're playing for the deer and the deer are sort of sensing that and they're getting much closer than they normally would and these are the kinds of experiences you can have when you're open to animism but also when you can acknowledge that there are elders and that there are elders in nature and what i've really found of all my time spent in the forest in sweden is that Whenever I'm willing to hear the name of something or to tell something my name, it will tell me their name back. So I mean, any kind of being in the forest, being animal or rock or, you know, whatever it may be, I've learned to come and actually introduce myself like you do with a human being. You don't barge into their house, like you knock on the door and say hello. And I've started like doing that in these locations. And often there's a being that will talk back and tell me their name. And then you have a dialogue. So, um, yeah, so I'm very much on the same page as the two of you are. But I also think we're coming up to the time where, you know, uh, there's not just the three of us, there is our audience. And I think there may be questions that have come in. So are we ready to um, answer some questions, maybe? What do you think? Sure. Yeah. Go for it. So. I strongly have to disagree in the honoring of toxic ancestral lines. Many Shimoni cultures actually have ostracization of people that have dishonored their family descendants. Yes, that's true. And that is very, very rare. In most cases, it's a matter of those toxic ancestors are sometimes excluded and sometimes they are you know they try to heal that the first instinct is always toward healing reconciliation and reconnection and it's only when it becomes clear that that is not possible that they go on to exclusion so and i don't know about many shamanic cultures i've been studying shamanism and shamanic cultures for 45 years now and I don't know of many. I would say I know of a couple, uh, but maybe you have a different definition of shamanic culture. I have observed in my own experience of, you know, ancestors behaving badly. Most of the time, it is because of something that happened to them. There has been the compounding of some oppression in their lives that in many cases turned them into oppressor. 
or or just or beat them down even further. And so that is an avenue that I feel I have to explore when that comes up in in my ancestral tending. Um, I don't necessarily jump up and down about it by a long shot, but it but it is something that I have to take into consideration when that comes up. Yeah, and the final thing I will add is that in Tibetan burn shamanism, there is this idea of that, you know, you feed demons until they become allies, so they don't have a very distinct, so that, you know, this is either, either like an enemy or an ally. The idea is, the question is like how hungry, meaning how emotionally needy is that being. But the idea then also being, if, if we make the commitment to do the work of feeding, and whatever that needs to be fed, or you have to work out what the appropriate offering or feeding is. But through that process of feeding that need that has come on that, often what appears to be like, you know, a demon or an enemy or a toxic ancestor can actually over time become a supportive presence or an ally in our lives. And that's the way I, uh, that's the model I use when I introduce that to my students, introduce people to the idea it doesn't need to be cast in, in stone or in black or white uh, forever after. Yeah, and there's also the element, keep in mind that once someone passes into the ancestral realm, they're now in soul, and a lot of that toxicity is due to the ego and to the things that happen in this lifetime. And once that is released and dissolved, quite often they can be a beneficial uh, representative within the ancestral realm. Yeah. And they continue to evolve in the other world. That's another thing people overlook. Like, you know, you freeze them in time, like as it was maybe 50 years ago, but they have been on their journey evolving. One hopes. Yeah. So, oh, another question. <laughs> yes. yeah, <exactly>. It's true. <laughs> a lot of people that I work with get really stuck on, do you mean my toaster is alive? And, you know, <laughs> and all the other things <laughs> that are aspects of animism, they're like, my toaster is alive. But yeah, I mean, there's a point where we have to acknowledge that everything around us is life force and we are in some kind of relationship with it. Yeah. And I would say that sometimes that isn't necessarily shamanic, it's definitely animistic, but you know, when you, bounce, you run into a wall and apologize to it, that's not animism, that's just manners. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. If someone wanted to follow the shamanic pathway on their own, where would they start? Or is it better to find a teacher and mentor? Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you can read yeah. the books. They're excellent books, yes. but do get a teacher. <laughs> yes. yeah. they, they say that there are a few things you need to become a shaman. One is to be chosen by the spirits. Another one is initiation. Another one is a human teacher to actually put it into context and make it work. Right. Right. If you don't, you will be awash in really huge transformative experiences that you do not That's understand right. and that people often cannot make sense of them. And then life, people can feel that life is against them or that they're being hard done by. I mean, you know, people can go down some very difficult tracks if they don't receive human mentoring. So I agree with the previous two speakers, with my colleagues. That's the question I get a lot. Like, why can't I just do this on my own? And I'm like, you can. Yeah. You, you can do some of it on your own but you don't have a context to put it in without a human teacher who can give you a place to have the experiences that you need to have for this to really yeah. situate for you. Actually, I have an article on the, not the most recent, but the issue before this and uh, Sacred Hoop talking about shamanism in the West, you know, planting the seed of shamanism in the West and the fact that one of our biggest obstacles is the lack of context and we don't we don't live in a shamanic culture we don't live in a culture that even knows what animism is much less shamanism yes and so that is uh you know i i'm one of those self-taught shamans in a sense in the sense that it was years a decade before i found teachers that could give me some context for it so all i had was grandfather had no idea it was shamanism all i knew is that my life was chaotic and crazy and hell. 
I don't yeah. understand it. Yeah. No, it's not a comfortable place to be. No. <laughs> Uh, we're coming up to um, 6.45, so yeah, here's Trevor. Thank you Thank all. you so much, Trevor. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. So, so thank you, audience, and thank you, Kelly and Ken. It's been wonderful being on this panel with you. Really enjoyed it. I'm sure that uh, Trevor will be putting little things here about our websites and everything, so hopefully we can chat again sometime soon. Yes. Thank you all. Cheers. Let's do that. Okay.